Thanks for stopping by Big Top Gaming. My name is Brian, and in this video, we're going to be doing our first ever painting tutorial for a Privateer Press miniature. So I had been flirting with minions a little bit lately, and I said, ah, why don't we just go ahead and pull the minions Facebook group and see what they want to throw out there for a, a piece for us to paint. So the uh, the responses were pretty uh, split between some of the pharaoh and blind water choices but uh barnabas lord of blood ended up taking it all and uh, that's what we're going to hit in this one so this is the first time i've tried to paint a model like this or, or film a model being painted like this and uh, there's going to be some kinks in the beginning that i eventually work out and the length is definitely something to be cautious or not cautious but cognizant of but uh, I am going to do my best to try and improve that as we go along, uh, or at least as long as I keep doing these, because I, I do enjoy painting quite a bit, and showing people how to paint some of this stuff is always really fun to me. So uh, bear with me through the technical difficulties, and I swear this thing will get better as it goes along. Otherwise, uh, enjoy watching, and we'll get right into it. So I've decided to prime Barnabas in gray just because we're going to be working with a lot of dark and light colors. So painting with the gray primer makes things a little bit easier. You have to build up less coats. So I also like to start with the deepest features of the model and we're going to start with the inside of Barnabas's mouth. Uh, the color that I'm applying right here is going to be uh, from Scale 75's Fantasy line and this is Orcish Dermis, like skin. So uh, essentially, I'm just going to be running this color through here. Ultimately, the when I think about the mouths of alligators uh, or crocodiles, I guess. Yeah, no, he's an alligator. I don't think there are any crocodiles in the Iron Kingdoms. They haven't like evolved to that point to be able to uh, maim and destroy and fight for swamps, I guess. Uh, but when I think about our real world alligators, the mouths on them are pretty light pink, almost uh, white in some areas. So I want to kind of convey that here and have this really bright and live uh, look to the mouth and tongue. So we're, we're going to smash this color a couple times. And uh, here we go. We've layered a couple couple shots on it because it is a, a pretty weak pigment and uh, it's a light color too so we got to do it a couple times to make sure it works but it turns out to leave a pretty nice base uh, to work with and the uh, next color that I'm integrating into here is just mixing about one to one with Orcish Dermish and Ishtar Pink from Scale 7.5 the fantasy line also. Uh, the consistency of this paint is going to be a little bit more on the thin side. I'd probably say two to one uh, with water to paint. And the the goal here the, that I'm trying to get to is just uh, building up these colors lightly. We're kind of taking um, a like a kind of like lazy layering I guess is what I would call it so the way I'm painting this mouth is by just kind of slowly building up the colors to the strength or the brightness that I want in these highlights so we started with the pretty dark uh, orcish dermis and now we're just going in with straight ishtar pink to highlight the rest of the tongue and parts of the gums too. I mean, some of this is going to be reflecting the light uh, and this one again is is still that two to one uh, water to paint ratio. Uh, I feel like you can kind of slide the paint around and uh, deposit it in a way where the pigment still stays pretty strong. You can see that it's getting pretty bright here. But I do think at this point I've decided to introduce another color into the tongue because we just weren't quite getting bright enough yet. And uh, that's going to be Moonray Flesh from Scale 7.5's Fantasy line. I do have a whole set of this stuff, so I do paint with it often. Um, but more, more so, I kind of look to each set for specific colors. And this uh, really, like, fleshy pink type color that, I, that they've got going on really, like, ticks all the boxes. So um, this is definitely the color that I use for the inside of all the gators' mouths. Uh, sometimes I use it for other stuff too, like I guess uh, my Grimkins, uh, all my little gremlins have this kind of uh, color for their skin tone. They got that like cool pinky flesh kind of thing going on. But uh, we're just hitting a little bit of some of the really high areas, especially on these like little flaps on the side of the mouth. Um, I think typically those are a little bit more on the whitish green side or whatever like the color the belly scales are going to be. But I decided to leave them pink. I just think it has a better effect. 
And then finally, I'm, I'm not quite satisfied with the brightness of the mouth yet. So I've decided to go in with just straight Moonray flesh. Um, so the instead of having any of that Ishtar pink hanging around, we're just going straight Moonray flesh or the Moonray flesh. So that's going to make sure that we get those nice uh, peaked white highlights that you'll usually see out in the wild, and it ends up leaving a pretty nice effect on the tongue. It looks pretty uh, pretty gnarly from a, a distance. This model is definitely going to be. We're, we're trying to pay a little bit more attention to it because we want to make sure the warlocks look super cool. And uh, that's why we're doing all this intense layering for something as trivial as just the mouth. But you can see I've kind of left a line in, down the middle of the tongue to kind of show there's some definition in there. And now I'm just coming back with another dilution of the Moonray flesh because the layer that I had left on previously didn't quite strengthen up the way I wanted it to. So I got to come back in and throw some more layers on there just to make sure that that color really stands out. I think we really want to show some high contrast between the Orcish Dermis and the Moonray flesh. If you look at these two colors, they really are completely different different and they end up blending really well on this piece. So the natural progression for the next deepest feature that I don't have to mess with if uh, or that I don't have to worry about messing with anything if I kind of paint weird is going to be the teeth. So the color that I'm using to base all these teeth is also from the Scale 7 5 Fantasy line. I swear that it, we're going to introduce some other paints in here eventually, but this was just what I grabbed. Um, and uh, the pigmentation in it is pretty weak with it being kind of more of a yellowy brown. So normally the color that I'd pull, pick or uh, want for something like this is uh, Vallejo Game Color makes a really great brownish yellow for this kind of stuff. I use it for basing all of my bone things, and that's uh, snake leather or leather brown, leather brown. It's a ripoff of snake bite leather, the old GW color, but it's called leather brown, and that's the one I'd prefer to use here, but I usually have tons of it on hand, but I've seemed to have burned all through it, so uh, sorry about taking the model off the screen there. I need to kind of paint some lines on where I need to keep this thing in frame. So I end up dropping another coat of peanut butter onto those teeth because it just wasn't strong enough. So now I'm gonna go ahead and introduce the first highlight on the teeth, and that's going to be a mix of that peanut butter color and uh, more gas brown. You know, now that I'm thinking about it and looking at the color of that paintbrush, I don't think peanut butter was part of the mix on this one. Uh, I think what I ended up doing was I was really uh, frustrated with the coverage of it so I decided to mix my own version of leather brown and that was with uh, uh, one part Averlin Sunset it's a GW base color or Citadel base color and then one part uh, I think it's Marion Brown from Vallejo Game Color. Those two mixed together give me a pretty good uh, like comparison to Leather Brown. And uh, having the GW base color in there makes sure that it's nice and strong. So the or the pigmentation is really strong, so it covers really well. So all the work that I did with that peanut butter and still had some of the gray showing through on it kind of uh, didn't really matter so much anymore because I was able to come back with those colors and block them in really well. I think now based on the way things look that we've hit the stage where I'm just using straight Morgast brown to put the first highlight on those teeth. And I know these teeth are super duper tiny in comparison to the rest of the model, but uh, they will stand out nicely against the, the skin tone that we paint, and they're de we definitely want them to stand out a bit against the... Uh, uh, the mouth that is hanging out here because that yellow it's it's not that the color that we did the the mouth in or the inside of the mouth is more close to yellow but that moonray flesh highlight is kind of playing off of some of the white in there so i want to make sure that i've got a couple highlights on here to be able to pick out these teeth real well i don't want them blending too much into that pinkish color that i've got in the mouth already what you see me putting on here is just a very small highlight of a mix between morgast brown and uh dead white from Vallejo game color. You can pretty much use any white you want. Um, I've 
don't think there's I think there's better ones out there but um or they're not that there's better but there's definitely a, a continuum of good versus bad for white paint and Vallejo dead white is really good from Vallejo game color the pigmentation's strong in it and it dilutes well but uh if I had my choice over what white to use which I did in this one but I just didn't do it I'd probably grab for the white from Chimera next up we're gonna hit the viscera that's in Barnabas's chest so the privateer press standard or the the studio art just has it done in a big glow and we'll be adding a glow to the chest eventually but i wanted to get this viscera started just so that we could show that it's there and that it's you know fleshy and torn up and gross so the color that i use for that is i'm going more for a, a pinkish purple and we're mixing in vallejo game colors hexed lichen which is really dark purple and then we're mixing that in with uh, games workshop or citadel's mephiston red when it comes to citadel colors uh, the base colors are one of my favorites to use that you can easily get in any game store they have strong pigmentation they cover really well and they dilute nicely so that you can do some kind of layering i'm really sorry for the angles that come on this one uh i'm, I'm working on it don't worry it'll get better and the then this won't be so terrible but just paint the inside of his chest that color and that's where we're at so I didn't have to go in with a second coat of this or anything because that color really, it covers really, really well. So we're going to start highlighting the the heart that's in his chest, but then we're going to highlight some of the sinew, I guess, that's kind of stretched around it. Most of that's going to get blocked out by the glows that we put in, but the color that we're doing to highlight here, or using to highlight here, is going to be that Mephiston red again, but this time we're mixing it with Vallejo Game Colors Warlord Purple. And this is kind of a, one of my favorite colors. You can kind of tell because I've got some of it tattooed on my arm. But the, the I love pinks and purples. It's just such a fun color to work with. And there's so many other ways you can utilize it to introduce a bunch of contrast onto a model to make it look like it pops really good. And uh, these colors are really fun to use. And just uh, this way we're kind of getting a, a more like... I don't know the the more pink and purple viscera looks the more like i don't know the more like uh i don't know it just looks odd like it's unsettling looking right like we're not going for super duper realistic here we're trying to call out a bunch of colors and uh one of the reasons why we're going with this purple color in here is because uh, i keep talking about contrast and i don't know if many people kind of get what i'm what people mean when they say that i think some people when they have miniatures judged or something they're like you need to up your contrast but don't understand what they're getting at what i'm thinking is this purplish red mix is going to bounce really well off of the greenish yellow skin that i'm going to be painting barnabas in so instead of just having this as like a dead purple or dead pink with white highlights that's not really going to uh, achieve a bunch of contrast between the skin tone because it just doesn't quite line up on the color wheel. Um, when we do pink, we're kind of taking away a lot of the vibrance and the green that we would use is going to, would be normally pretty dull. So we want to increase the vibrance of the chest cavity by having that pinkish purple in there and making it nice and deep and rich. And then we want to do something similar with the skin tone where we've got that yellowish green instead of that dead, like, uh, mopey green where people mix in bone colors lastly i've decided to mix in a little bit of moonray flesh to get some of the big highlights on the heart because that part is not going to be glowing so i want to make sure we've got a lot of attention called to that piece so now we get a little bit better of an angle so finally we're here uh, but next up we are going to do the rib cage that is poking out of Barnabas's chest and uh, we're coming back in with that uh, that mix that I had made earlier for the teeth as the base coat and you can already see that it's covering really well just to remind you that's an equal part mix of Averlin Sunset from Games Workshop or Citadel and uh, Marion Brown from Vallejo Game Color you can just see like right away this yellowish brown just goes down easy on the on this gray painted piece if this piece were 
based or, or primed in black. It might take you a few more coats to get there, but uh, again, since I've gone with gray, I know that there's a lot of colors in here that are going to be going really deep like we did with that purple, but that was a cinch to do because gray is just easier to turn darker and lighter, whereas black, you really, sometimes you even have problems doing something like a, a medium toned purple on black so I just enjoy priming my models in gray for the most part. Next up we got to start highlighting this rib cage and for the next step up I'm going to be taking that previous mix that we had and introducing some more gassed brown from Games Workshop. Like I said I do really like these uh the Valet or not Vallejo the Games Workshop uh base coats especially when you're getting to some of those more pain in the butt colors to do just because they are so heavily pigmented and they can really go down easy. Um, there's definitely uh, a lot of different paints out there for us to choose from and they all are good in their own circumstance. But I think the Games Workshop ones are probably some of the best like all comer paints although the Vallejo ones definitely have uh, some strength it's just that some of their more problematic colors like the yellows and reds are really just hard to work with for me just because of the way they're pigmented but uh, you can see work I think at this point I've decided to go in with straight Morgast Brown from GW and uh, this is just to grab those uh, peaked highlights on the rib cage uh, again I want these to stand out quite a bit because they are the the whole like drama of the chest cavity on Barnabas is a big deal so I think I've even added just a little bit of uh, Vallejo dead white in this next step to just pull out those very peaks just so you know like what it is and your eyes drawn to it like Barnabas is a big model so you're going to be able to see all these cool details on him but the more attention I bring to that by having a lot of contrast between my darkest color and my lightest color on each and every little portion of the model is really going to call a lot of attention to that. Next up is the skin. Now this is the this is a fun part because I had kept talking about jamming contrast like crazy, right? And I think that for most gators, a lot of people are going to start with these brownish greens and then highlight to maybe like a dead fleshy green color with maybe some bone mixed in there. And that's fine, but the thing is is that you when you start mixing in these whites, into colors that you're trying to highlight with, you're gonna be taking away a lot of the vibrance from a piece, which I had said earlier, we want to maintain to keep driving a super bombastic contrast, right? So what I've decided to do is start the skin tone with uh, equal parts uh, Death World Forest, which is a Citadel base. I really do like those a lot. And then I've mixed in Reaper's uh, Charred Brown, which is a really, really dark brown. So I've saved you the trouble of having to watch me do the whole thing. But now uh, we're gonna be introducing, this is this is gonna look a little weird. We've spent so much time painstakingly highlighting the rest of the model, and now I'm gonna be throwing down some really sloppy highlights. And this looks funky because I have spent, you know, I think I spent more time uh, painting just his tongue than I am doing these highlights on one of the more big parts of this model. So we're blocking in these highlights to kind of prepare for what's coming next. And this is just straight Death World Forest from that Citadel color. You can see it's got this really cool greenish yellow look to it. It doesn't look so dead that we're losing a lot of the vibrance in the color. It's bringing a lot of uh, brightness to Barnabas and it's going to look really cool against the cloak because we are going to keep that red. Essentially, again, we're just kind of blocking these colors in. I want to make sure that uh, the highlights are catching on the areas where light would hit this model. But And I'm paying a little bit more attention, not being so haphazard with the top of his uh, jaw, because uh, that is going to be a part that people see quite a bit. And uh, I don't want to haphazardly highlight this because I want it to be a key feature on the model because he has so much detail on that top part of his jaw. So 
So now that we've done that, you get to see kind of my master plan unpack here. And uh, I'm do I, the thing about painting f the Gatorman flesh is that they have all these nooks and crannies for every single scale on their body. And some of them aren't so deeply sculpted as the next one. So the best way to do this instead of going around and painting in every single one is to just wash the model. And what I'm using here is a mixture of Beal Tan Green from Citadel and then Agrax Earthshade. I think it's two parts Agrax Earthshade and one part green. But there is a special ingredient that I've added in here to make sure that this pools to all those recesses really nicely because oftentimes your acrylic washes are going to kind of glaze the model and leave this really dingy opaque coloring that's going to take away a lot of the vibrance that we've built up. So I've decided to add one part Liquitex Flow Aid and that just cuts down on the surface tension of the liquid that we're working with and allows the uh, the paint to or the wash to kind of flow into the recesses as much as it can. You can see on some parts of the model that this wash has definitely flowed into more recesses than others like the knee is bent really odd so the recesses there are not so deep. If you were truly insane you could go ahead and carve these scales out a little bit i think got a little bit on his teeth there that i had to wipe up but we're going to let this dry and come back and see what it looks like so now it's dried down and you can see that i've le still left a little bit of a glaze on the uh on the highlights so they blend together a little bit and now uh you get to experience the tedium of highlighting scales now i I think scales are such a huge part of this model that I want to be able to call them out and show that there's this cool, rough, rugged, scaly Gatorman skin. And uh, in order to do that, I'm going back over it with just Death World Forest to kind of bring back some of the life into these higher peaks. When I'm going into an area where there's no shading, and I know this is annoying because the stupid axe is in the way, um, but it's really just hitting each edge of the... Uh, the scales with a, with this green. I'm using a really small brush and the paint's kind of hard to get the consistency that you want it to be because you want it to be liquid enough to where it flows off the brush easily but you want it to be still uh, held together enough so that you can control it and don't have it slip into any of these recesses. It seems to be about a two to one mix of water to paint especially since this is a, a Citadel base coat and those are, are a Citadel is it base or foundation? Yeah, I think old was foundation, now it's base. But the uh, that seems to be a good mix for these to make sure that it doesn't uh, get too wily on you. I'm going to spare you the tedium of watching me highlight every single scale on this, uh, on this model. And I'm just going to focus on the legs so you can kind of get the gist of what's going to happen. And uh, here I've decided to add the first highlight in. This is just going over the top edge of each scale, uh, essentially where the light would hit it. So you might have to change the edge that you're hitting as you go along the color that I've mixed in is just uh, in, in into the death world forest color that we were using before I've added p3's uh, necrotite green and this green is a really fun one especially when you're trying to do those cool Crixian glows that everyone likes but uh, when we are mixing that into the uh, death world forest what we end up getting is um, we're, we're brightening the color without losing any of that vibrancy again. I think when people want to brighten colors, sometimes they just mix in white, and that ends up kind of draining the vibrance from a color. It makes it kind of pastel looking. So the way that you end up combating that is by adding uh, white and the next color up on the color wheel, or like the traditional color wheel, not the weird magenta one that everyone likes. But... Um, Essentially, Necrotite Green already has yellow in it. It's like a yellow and green mix, so this ends up keeping that vibrancy really well. What I've added in to that, or added on top of that, was a little bit of Averland Sunset to that mix. And again, we're not adding any yellow, so or I mean, not adding any white, so we're not pulling from the vibrancy of the colors. And this should really make those scales pop from a distance. I mean, they're going to look good close up, but we want to make sure that people are seeing these scales from across the table. It's going to be a really cool effect, and then everyone's going to be able to tell like this Gator's got you know this rough scaly skin. You could kind of avoid all these steps if you just wanted to like a prime wash and then dry brush I wouldn't hold that against you at all because this does take a while and you'll see here 
that the effect that we end up getting once everything is said and done is pretty legit. Like, those scales are looking mean, he's green, and he's ready to kill some things, I guess. So next up, we're going to go in with the uh, the belly scales, since we've got the, uh, the, cool, uh, the cool, like, body scales done. And to start off the belly scales, we're going to be going in with a mix of that death world forest because the belly scales i do want them to be kind of comparable or at least relatable to the uh the skin tone because we don't want it to be too out there um it just kind of loses some of the consistency the way a gator would look so um death world forest green has been added and we mix that in with uh, vallejo game colors dead flesh um this is uh just kind of like a a pasty green and uh that's i think i even added just a little bit of averland sunset to this because i did want to point the belly scales a little bit more towards that yellow spectrum also um, but you can see with all those colors in here it's covering over that gray pretty well and this is a quite bright color so just another reason to uh kind of prime your models in gray so you don't have to fight the base coats that you want to put on all these pieces so really we're just running around the underbelly and then through the tail. We got a little bit under his jaw too. Uh, this color though, I do believe I'm going to do two coats of just to make sure that I get it nice and strong. I don't want a whole lot of that gray showing through. And again, it is a light color, so um, I'm pretty much fine having to hit this twice. But if I was, if this were a black model uh, or primed, yeah, if, if, if this were primed in black, this would just take forever to do. So after two base coats, this is what we end up with. We got this nice, consistent, yellowy, green, cool color. And now I've come in and added just a little bit of Moonray flesh to that uh, that mixture that we had already, that, that uh, Death World Forest plus Rotten Flesh. Or no, sorry, I'm getting too far ahead of myself. This is just straight Rotten Flesh, or dead flesh from uh, Vallejo game color. And we're just kind of going over the belly scales horizontally. Um, I'm not trying to leave a ton of the previous color behind uh, because I do want to try and hit one more highlight with this just to bring some more interest to the model's highlights. So uh, we're just kind of going around and leaving just a small line of the previous color back so that we have that shadow in there. Uh, this is, since the colors are so close to one another, I don't have to dilute this paint a whole lot. Um, probably more on that one-to-one -one scale because it is a bright color, so it's just kind of naturally going to be a little bit more translucent. So we don't have to worry about getting super crazy with the highlights. We just have to uh, get that first coat on and probably not have, we probably won't have to come back and add another coat to this one. But so far you can kind of see how the, the yellowy green highlights, I think that was my head hitting the camera. So I have to apologize for that. Like I said, this is a learning process for me. So uh, it will eventually just get better. I mean, it can only go up from here, I, I guess, but uh, really, to get back to what I was saying, uh, the yellowy green is really popping up against that chest cavity, and I think if we would have done this in more of like a dead p pink, that were like a pale pink or something, we just wouldn't kind of get that same kind of visual attraction that we're getting off of having this more yellowy uh, skin tone, or this more yellowy belly scale tone uh, up against the uh, really deep and vibrant purple. Now we're going to add one more final highlight to the belly scales, and this is going to be the, a mix one-to-one -one of the uh, dead flesh from Vallejo game color and going back to that Moonray flesh color from uh, Scale 7.5's Fantasy line. Uh, I don't use this color a ton, uh, especially since it's such a pale, like, peachy tone. It's almost like a weird brown, like a brown that's kind of or like a bone color, ivory color that's kind of tilted a little bit more towards peach. But uh, it seems to work out pretty well for kind of incorporating into these Gatorman models. But you can see the highlights now are really showing off the definition on those belly scales. So while we have this model on the table, we'll be able to discern all that and it'll look super sweet while he's uh, running around chopping stuff and making little bone shaker boys. 
and we're just really hitting the parts that would catch the light on that back tail but for the most part I think we're done with these belly scales uh, now we're gonna come in and do the leather pieces that are wrapped around him I think we're hitting the the legs and the one wrist that he has on his uh, left hand so this is just straight charred brown from Reaper uh, I think it's the, I don't know what series it I think they call it their master's series but reaper paints are still so, so strange to me I love them so much because you can just dilute them down and down and down and they still have a good suspension of pigment like they don't separate from the carrier and then you just get this weird mess slop that drifts all over the place but when it comes to trying to figure out what colors you need to get or where they're from like it, that's just foreign to me I think there's just something weird with how they decide to define all that plus a set. I would really like to get a set of Reaper paints, but again, it's just hard for me to get all that together, so I just kind of like pick them up when I pick them up, and, and that's the way it works for me. But uh, while I'm at it, I'm also going to hit the uh, the weapon handles, or the weapon in the fetish, would you call it? I'm not sure what, or a banner. I'm not sure what Barnabas would quite call that one, but uh, we're just kind of using the paint because we got it here, and this isn't a bad way to start out the wood. I'm not 100% sure at this particular point if those are going to get highlighted up further than that but uh, that's what I'm trying that's what I'm doing with them now just to kind of get a head start on them but we're uh, just covering all these this color is nice for uh, jamming the color down like or the paint's nice for jamming the color down it's nice and uh, saturated and it's going to give us a nice dark shadow to start working with some of these leather pieces now I know that a lot of people will dry brush their leather because you can kind of build up some cool textures on it but with this one I'm going to be kind of painting the texture in and here we're going to be jamming some of that more like awkward contrast right uh, to highlight this I'm mixing uh, the charred brown with uh, Games Workshop Mephiston Red and that brings our brownish leather more towards a red and that's going to pop real nice off of the skin tone here because the skin tone is still nice and vibrant and green so even just this little trace of red that we have in the the leather pieces that's on Barnabas here are going to really play off nicely on that and show off a lot of a uh, lot of cool interest I keep saying all these like hot phrases like contrast and visual interest but really that, that it's just gonna look cool because of the way the color work in the way that our eyes see color and really get attracted to it so to highlight the leather straps we're gonna be adding in some I think I added a little bit of peanut butter into this not like the actual peanut butter the peanut butter from scale 75 because painting with peanut butter would be really awkward um, but maybe I can try it someday who knows but anyways uh, we're just putting that highlight on here I, I could have gone for a little bit brighter of a red but I think pointing this towards a little bit of orange on the on this on the the color scale isn't so bad for it because it's still close enough to red to where it just kind of like works that way I think certain when you are making brown right and you're mixing between red and orange it's really easy to kind of uh, tilt those one way or the other and I, I kind of glazed over it but when I was painting these I wasn't doing like sweeping highlights it was more of just jabbing it with the brush a little bit to bring up some of the texture in the highlights instead of just doing these smooth highlights like I did on the belly so that's another way you can kind of get that texturized leather look but I'm not really going into weathering these a whole lot uh, I could go in and do like maybe some light sponging of some super bright oranges and just make it look like it's worn down but I decided to skip that the next thing I'm working on here is just painting the top of his tail scales uh, black uh, this is just something that I normally would do on any Gatorman model and uh, while I'm at it I'm just going to put the base of black on this axe and when we get to doing the axe it's gonna be pretty sweet because I really do enjoy painting metals and have a couple different ways of doing it that make it look really neat uh, but for this axe as a preview we're gonna be kind of doing this in a true metal style and there's going to be a lot of wet blending on this one so definitely stay tuned if you uh, are wanting to find out how to do some cool wet blending on metals but for the tail scales now since we kind of hit the the black paint on the uh, the axe and for what it's worth the 
paint I'm using here is coal black from Chimera. I could almost do a whole video on just painting with Chimera paints in general because they're so interesting and unique. Uh, and that, that could be something that happens in the future, but uh, you can basically use whatever black paint you want to on this. It's, there's no real... I don't think there's such a thing as a bad black that comes from a, a model paint producer. You can get some really junky blacks, but uh, while I'm jabbering about blacks, um, the highlight for this color is going to be a mix of Vallejo Game Color Somber Gray. When I do paint the color black, I really do like to point them more towards that gray as the highlight instead of like a bluish gray as the highlight instead of like a white gray or some people do purples. Um, but for the way that I want these scales to look, that's how I'm going to do it. And I figure while I've got those colors out, I might as well do the claws too. I could do these in that bone color like his teeth and his ribs are, but uh, I always think that it's just looked cooler to me when I do their toenails or their fingernails in uh, black. I guess like they're probably not toenails, they'd probably call them claws, right? But uh, the 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 bony protrusions on their feet and hands are just going to be done with this somber gray black mix, and then I'll highlight them to... Uh, the very, I almost, I think it's almost just straight somber gray, just to kind of pull out some more uh, attention to those. Um, on the, up against the, the bone surfboard that he's kind of kicking around on, you'll be able to really see the difference between the nails and the, um, the base that he's standing on. You can already kind of see how it's, how they stand out really well like that. But with the hands, it's going to be a little bit more different. Uh, the The wood is going to probably sit pretty well against it, especially since I kind of tint my woods more towards the orange side. And with that somber gray, it's kind of more blue gray. So that should be quite enough contrast there to pick that up. The next part that we're doing is probably one of my favorite parts on this model. And that's just the uh, the cloak that he wears or the hood cape. It's the clothing that he wears. And we're going to go ahead and stick with red because it is going to bounce really nicely off that crazy vibrant green that we've got all over his scales already. So to start that out, I've decided to mix uh, equal parts uh, charred brown from Reaper along with my, one of my favorite reds in the entire industry, and that's gore red from Reaper as well. I think that's Reaper Master Series too. Maybe they're all called Master Series. I'm not sure. But... Um, Gore Red is such a great red to do just about anything with. It's kind of more tinted towards that brown side. And if you are if you have problems painting red, like red is just the bane of your existence, I think getting this color is going to be really useful for you, uh, especially since I had mentioned earlier the Reaper paints are just so, like, they're, you, you can't dilute them to where the pigment falls out of suspension, really. I mean, I, I imagine you could if you really, like, went, went ham on the water, but the colors just kind of stick. And uh, one of the things about red that makes it difficult to paint is that it is quite translucent, and the pigmentation isn't always so strong. But the Reaper colors kind of solve some of that for me. Plus, I can kind of... What I'm going to do with the rest of this model to highlight that red up is kind of lean into the whole problem of the red paints kind of being a little bit more loose and translucent. So we're going in now with just straight gore red. And you saw me wiping some of the paint off on there because this is going to be a little bit, a little bit more close to traditional layering where I'm pulling the paint in the direction that I want the highlight to find its apex and what that does is uh, my brush gets loaded up with paint and then uh, since it's so thin I'm able to kind of keep the paint inside the well of the brush and then when I pull off of the model that's where a lot of the paint deposits itself so we kind of have this thin opaque layer of red going over the piece that I'm painting and then the higher concentration of the pigment is going to be depositing on the highlight so that part's going to be a little bit stronger and uh, it might not come through so well in this video but you can kind of see especially on these folds on the top of the head where there's a huge difference between where I start painting and where I stop painting in terms of how the red looks when you're working w with this style of layering 
you can go over this as much as you want to but you have to be really cognizant of where you're starting your brush it's not like how you would be normally painting by turning something completely one color you don't want to start from the first place you put your brush down you kind of want to keep pulling back further and further leaving less of or kind of leaving the less painted part behind so that you can get a nice transition and you don't end up blocking the color out uh, that means that you just don't you're not painting just one big highlight that's really easy to separate you can kind of see now that these colors have dried up a bit we've still got some of that uh, that charred brown mix still kind of list hang, hanging around underneath and that's giving us a nice smooth transition for this red so uh, I think for this part I maybe put in I'm trying to remember I think that this was just another go at um, gore red I wanted to just uh, increase the saturation of that color a bit so I went around the entire model again and I'm you can see that how I'm applying what I had said about how those highlights are not going exactly where they're not going exactly where I put them last time I'm kind of shrinking them down a little bit except for when it comes to the top of his head because that's where a lot of the lights gonna be catching on this model and I want to make sure there's a lot of uh, br uh, the highlights are really strong there and then while I was doing this, I forgot the inside of his cloak, which is not going to be extremely difficult to do because there's not a whole lot that I need to highlight here. So I'm just taking that original charred brown mixture and putting that underneath. And then uh, I get a little little fancy here and I decide to wet blend some, uh, some of the straight uh, gore red in there. It really was just me throwing it on and kind of moshing it into the other stuff so it looks like it's uh, kind of mixing well together. So now I'm coming in with a mix between Gore Red and the Mephiston Red from Games Workshop. And this is just going to be a very slight highlight. You can see me kind of building up the color on the edge of the clo cloak here. I want to make sure that those are nice big sweeping uh, highlights that catch the edge and make it nice and bright and cool. Uh, and I'm trying to be mindful of where that back piece is going to go on him I figured this model would be too much of a pain in the butt to paint with that thing on there so I am doing it as a sub assembly sub assembly deal um, just to make my life a little bit easier and it's mostly all bone so it's I can just sit there and airbrush it with the with the the morgast brown and start with a good nice bone color but uh, essentially this is the same deal. This paint is heavily diluted. It's probably something like three to one water to paint, maybe even four to one. Uh, I'm not really like super strict on my dilution ratios. It's just that's what I think that I have it at because that's about where you can start. If you're working on your palette, you can start to see the palette through the paint as you're starting to mix it around you can see we've already got a really nice bright red going on here but we're gonna go ahead and kick this up one more notch just to get this super duper bright red going on and we're gonna go ahead and hit the model with just pure mephiston red and it looks like it's taking me a while to get that paint out but it'll happen soon here we are so again, wiping a little bit of my brush off on that uh, pill bottle that I use as a as a holder, and then we're just doing very slight the slight edges. We want to not completely just jam this highlight into the model, but uh, except for maybe on the top of his head. But we just really want to make the edges zing with this super duper bright red. And since we've built up all those layers, and we're already fully aware that this color is going to be a little bit more transparent to work onto this model uh, we're, we're gonna have some good results of getting that bright red communicated I think oftentimes people have issues getting this bright red and it's all about just working it up I mean we worked it up from brown to this super duper bright orangey red and it looks pretty sweet next up I've decided to work on the trim for the cloak and I'm not quite sure why I decided to go with yellow on this one but I think it's just a, a the color works with what we're trying to do here and uh, it's also another tough one for people to paint, so I figured it would be not a bad time to just kind of show how I go through my process of painting yellow. The first thing that we're doing is we're kind we're kind of going back to some of those brown base coats that I had worked with before. I'm mixing Vallejo Game Colors Beastie Brown with Averland Sunset. Now, if you're one of these people that has a really difficult time painting 
yellow in general. I think Averland Sunset from Games Workshop is one of the best paints you can use to tr start building up that yellow color. Now, it's very like Bart Simpson skin yellow. But if you're trying to build up to these super bright yellows, it's definitely the best way to go. I think that's like the real key, like I had discussed with the red, uh, when it comes to building or painting these really vibrant, difficult to do colors like white, red, or orange, or yellow. Uh, it's all about building up from a pretty strong base, even if it happens to be a little bit more dark. Uh, we are going to end up taking the highlights on the trim on this to a pretty bright yellow. So once we uh, once we get there, you'll, you'll kind of see how it all plays out. But in in addition to not only creating a nice, good, strong base for us to work with, w when we pick up these darker yellows or brownish yellows, is that they also are gonna help us deliver quite a bit of contrast between the base coat and the highlight. And I'm sorry for the brightness change here, I think, uh, things are just a little bit wonky weather-wise around here, so the window that I have that should stay closed just kind of like flies open and closed on a, on a whim. So the next color that I'm going with, I believe this is just straight Averland Sunset, and this I have to thin down a little bit more than what I normally would. I think when I usually paint with these Vallejo, or not Vallejo, these Games Workshops base or foundation paints, I'm typically going like a one-to-one -one ratio with water to paint, but with this one I'm dropping it down to like two-to-one water to paint, and that just means that the, the, the paint can handle being separated that much from itself, but uh, it's still going to dry pretty translucent while still communicating that color that's there. And I think now I'm just mixing in a little bit of Uriel yellow, and you can kind of see as I use the bottom of my handle as a place to kind of take away some of the excess paint, I'm really trying to keep this thin again, about that 2 to 1 ratio, because I don't want to have these huge chunks of just blocked color, and having your paints thinned allows you to do this kind of pseudo layering style. I wouldn't say that this is what I, what you would consider to be like a traditional layering. It's more of just like kind of a, a lazy layering because I'm just, everything I've done in this model so far has been mixing the previous color with a little bit of the color that I'm aiming to get to and then uh, eventually getting up to the main color that I want. So here we've decided to go with just a straight mix of Uriel yellow from... Uh, Games Workshop. Now this is a layer paint, and it is one of the better yellows that I've found when it comes to trying to get this super bright, sunbursty yellow look. Uh, I think that uh, Chimera, again, is another one that's got a really good yellow, but that paint's not always the most accessible since they seem to sell out of it pretty quickly, and they're kind of a, a small operation, so production isn't the easiest for them. But since you, if you're having problems getting a hold of those or don't even want to touch them, uh, Uriel Yellow is a really good color that's quite accessible uh, that you can use to get these super bright yellows. And the last color that I'm coming in with is just mixing in a little bit of, I believe I used Moonray Flesh to mix in to make it brighter. I didn't want to put in so much white because I think white, when you mix in white with your previous color to try and get a highlight, you're going to tone down that vibrance a lot. It ends up muting the color quite a bit, and uh, having having just a little bit of that brownish white in there is going to be pretty helpful to make sure that you don't uh, kill your colors or the brightness or vibrance of your colors. And then I believe I come back in one more time with just a little bit more Moonray Flesh mixed in, just so I can kind of get these super high uh, points of highlight going on. And then I'm just kind of tracing around. There's like a little bead or cord of cloth that's part of this, and that's what I was doing there. Next up, we're going to go to what I would consider, or what I'd call the Charlie Brown stripes, because like that's kind of the unfortunate result that I have here, is uh, there's an etched-in pattern, which is really helpful when it comes to freehanding. It makes things a lot easier, but uh, it definitely my color choice of yellow kind of makes it look like he's a Barnabas Charlie Brown style. So painting freestyle can be a little bit intimidating for people. Uh, what I'm, I'm using a, a very small brush here that's got a very long uh, set of bristles. And the reason for that 
is uh, first of all, like it just makes if that's the kind of brush you can get access to, it makes freehanding a lot easier. Uh, it allows me to kind of line the brush up with the uh, the line that I'm going against in the uh, cloak, so that way I don't have to pay too much attention to painting with the tip of the brush. I can kind of just do what brushes want to do naturally, which is just kind of slide along the the angle of the brush there aren't many brushes out there that i think you want to be using the exact tip of the brush to paint with so if you can use the natural flow of the brush to manipulate your paint and kind of follow the uh, the lines i think it makes things a lot easier now, i'm not going to go through painting the entire stripe on this model because it's quite a bit and it's in some hard to reach places so if you want more information on freehanding just comment and uh, i can probably look at setting up a video in the future for that so now we've finished completely i think i maybe have highlighted at this point but you can see the the stripes look pretty sweet and uh i think the highlight on on some of the edges i didn't have to use much was just some of that uh that shadow gray from vallejo now i'm getting to the ropes and there's a lot of ropes on this model so i believe i'm only going to be working with the foot ropes on this one because there are definitely some that are layered in ways where like uh, it's gonna kind of confuse how I do things here like this rope is completely on top of a piece that's totally done whereas like the ropes that are on the bone shoulders aren't done the ropes on the fetish aren't done so uh, what we're doing here is we're mixing Averland Sunset and uh, that Beastie Brown again for this one and then I've come in with taking that same mix and adding in a little bit of Morgast Brown so that I can go around and do the highlights. Now typically with ropes, I don't just kind of haphazardly highlight like I'm doing here, uh, but with this one I kind of have to because the ropes are pretty tiny, so I can't do the little highlights on the beads, so I'm just kind of jabbing the brush in at re different points to kind of get that look that it's highlighted. You can see that I kind of overshot the brush there and got some of it on his leg. If you do something like that, just work quickly, grab another brush and get it wet, and then you can dilute the paint while it's on the model. Then you dry that brush up, and or dry that brush off, and then the paint and water mixed together will wick up. And then if you've moved quickly enough and got enough water on there, you won't have to worry about that, uh, that bit of paint kind of spoiling your model. So that's kind of the gist of how we would be highlighting the ropes for the rest of this model. It's a pretty straightforward process, and like I said, since they're so tiny, uh, it's not... Oh, you know what? I'm not even doing the ropes right now. I'm sorry. These are bones. So for the bones, I typically will do bones more yellowy. But since this uh, model's got quite a bit of yellow worked into it between the green and that big old Charlie Brown stripe around his uh, the trim on his cloak, I've decided to darken the bones a little bit. And I should have known better because I saw all the bones base coated. But um, we're mixing Morgast Brown and Charred Brown together to kind of get this more dingy uh, bone look, something that maybe they're, they're pretty dirty and old and gross. And then I've highlighted them with uh, just straight Morgast Brown. And now we're going in with uh, some highlights of Morgast Brown plus Moonray Flesh. That Moonray Flesh color, I, I have only really utilized it on extremely fair skin tones. But uh, I, after filming this video, or while filming this video, I realized it was a pretty good mix for a highlight for bone colors to kind of pull them up out of that yellowy color. And uh, this is the having that dark base coat of the super dark brown, well, the brownish tan, uh, means that these bo bones are going to stand out a lot and they're not going to be fighting so much with the skin tone because it's not pointed towards yellow as much as the skin tone or the underbelly scales are. And this is me just running the edge of the brush around these highlights. Um, I think not having the back piece here kind of makes the highlights a little weird because usually I would try to not highlight so strongly in areas where the uh, the back piece would be uh, blocking some of those shadows but just for ease of uh, painting I'm not too worried about it and now for the final highlight I think I've just taken that moonray flesh and uh, and Morgast brown mix and added a little bit of white and I just used the white from chimera on this one uh, it's a it's a strong white but Again, 
if you're if that's not a paint that you can easily get access to uh dead white from vallejo game color is a pretty good one i don't prefer any gw whites i think like it's got to be like nine out of ten ceramite whites usually come out looking like curdled milk so I just stopped buying them. It was when when you get a good pot of that, it's a really good white for blocking in color. But most of the time, there's just something about it, at least in the more recent experiences I've had, that just it doesn't work. So you can see I've gone around and kind of cut through the garbage of having to highlight all the bones on camera. But we went ahead and finished all those. You can kind of see how it looks really sweet. And there's a lot of... Uh, visual interest with that darker brown on there and it's not taking too much away from the model so now we're going in with uh the ropes and uh, that's still the same mix that i had stated previously it's the beastie brown mixed with averland sunset and i'm this one I'm, i've since the ropes are so tiny and there's so many other little ridged details with those bones i've kind of mixed this as a one to one ratio for paint to water because i want to control it quite a bit even if being a little bit thicker might make some of those roped details not look so great but we're just gonna run around the entire model and hit the edges of the ropes to make sure that we can uh, block this color in and get ready for the highlights so now we're just going through and highlighting now that all the the ropes have been base coated and uh, with the bones, I kind of explained the highlighting process, uh, but I was actually just calling out the ridges there. Um, again, that this model is, it's well detailed, but the, the detail is almost too good. Uh, in ZBrush or whatever you would have used to sculpt this model, I'm sure those ropes looked really nice and were called out really well. But for the actual sculpt, uh, it, it's hard to translate and paint those to make them look great, at least in my opinion. So I just try to do the best I can with those using that jab method. So now we're base coating the candles. And the, 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 the struggle with these is I want to make sure that they stand out from the bone because we are using a lot of that creamy white. And uh, I'm deciding to kick up the brightness on these quite a bit where I wouldn't normally. And I'm going through and adding a base coat of Morgast Brown. And uh, this one I end up having to do twice to get the tone to really register. But you can see here that's a really nice bright cream. And we've just mixed in white with, uh, with Morgast Brown to get these highlights. And we're not leaving a ton of that Morgast Brown behind. I want these candles to be communicated to be very white. So uh, they stand out quite a bit and get separated from the... Uh, the staff or the headdress or fetish or whatever you want to call it that he's holding. And uh, we're just tracing the little wax strip lines. And then if there's any big surfaces on the candles, like shaft or base, uh, we're going to highlight those as well. And not, not a ton on the back, but we're going to get a little bit back there since it's tilted quite a bit uh, for far back. And we don't think much of the light the way that we've decided to highlight this model is going to hit them there. But you see I'm kind of getting just the edges where the wax is meeting the first cross section of that uh that piece and then finally we're going to hit it with a super highlight of just pure white and uh, that's just going to further help this stand out quite a bit and show that these candles are very much a specifically different thing from the rest of the model So now we get to go over to the flames on the candles, and I've started this out with a mix of white and Uriel yellow. Now I could do probably an entire video on its own with flames, not just painting them, but understanding the science of how flames actually work and how the colors register. I think many people will attribute flames to being the whitish yellow at the hot spots, and then slowly transitioning to darker colors, going through full-on yellow to orange to red. And that's typically how I've painted flames and in the past and used use it in other mediums of art. But there definitely are circumstances where that flame register goes backwards or maybe goes in uh, different colors. Um, it all just depends on mostly the fuel and the oxygen saturation around them. But for the most part, I'm going to stick with the, uh, the, the traditional white to red and it's not even red so uh, I guess I can explain what I'm doing in the color now and we're just going with straight Uriel yellow I want the flames to be quite bright and I don't want them to be too cartoony looking so 
uh, when I say that, I mean there, that I don't want a ton of contrast between the very darkest edges and the very lightest edges. So I've decided to highlight with a little bit of Mephiston Red mixed in with that yellow, just to give it a little bit more orangey tone. And then the very tips of the flames, I'm going to put a little bit more Mephiston Red. And that's not to say that I don't have an orange that I appreciate or like. It's just that this color was on my palette, and making blending the, the yellow and red together can give you a pretty decent orange. Now, I'm not super stoked with how the separation between the orange tips and the rest of the yellow flame turned out here. I know that it's a little bit on the fuzzy side, but there's quite a bit of separation between those two. So I decide to try and filter the color with yellow. So I take my Uriel yellow again, and I'm watering it down quite a bit, uh, a bunch to where like if you move the paint across your palette, you can see through to the bottom of your palette. And all that's going to do is kind of make the blend a little bit easier. And uh, next up, we're going over to the wood. And I think I've gotten to the point here where the video is super duper long. I know it's going to be long. So I've decided to kind of just paint pieces and then apply them so that everyone else can, you know, take their time and do whatever in terms of like pausing the video and painting it themselves. But uh, I'm doing some wet blending or what I would consider to be wet blending on this staff. So I start out with the base of uh, charred brown from Reaper. And then I just slap... Uh, some beastie brown from Vallejo game color there's a lot of difference between those two but while they're still wet and malleable I can just kind of swing my brush around and mix them together and that's another thing we can talk about more in another video when we get there but now's the cool part that I wanted to show and this is how I typically will hand paint uh, my metals I start out with just a black paint and then I go in with scale seven fives uh, chain mail metal or chain metal no, it's it's black metal is what it is. I forget that they name them after band style or metal styles, but um, or musical metal styles. But now I'm doing that wet blending again, and I know this is kind of like the it, again, it's the elevator pitch of how I would do this. So it can definitely be expounded on in another video, a little bit more targeted one. But now we're coming in with uh, heavy metal from that same line, and I paint. A little bit of of that on it's it's not too thin this is like one-to-one -one paint to water and then uh, that lets me work pretty quick and it stays malleable enough to where I can kind of just mash the two colors together with my brush after it's been cleaned and that kind of gives me a nice transition that's smooth and when you look at the way the metal reflects uh, you can see that there's definitely some uh, transitional definition, I guess, if I'm, if that doesn't sound too pretentious, between the different shades of metal. So it looks really s smooth like metal should, but with having the uh, the darkest like mix being just that matte or satin black, it kind of gives us a better like metal appearance because uh, metal definitely reflects a lot of light but in its shadows it's not really reflecting any so this gives us this cool like effect on the table where you can tell it's metal and you can tell there's definitely some light play going on and you don't have to worry too much about the uh overt brightness if you were just to do a, a darker metal mixed with a lighter metal and then mixed with a super light metal and we're kind of doing the same thing at the top of the axe head here just to kind of bring some attention to where a lot of the light would catch that. And I think now I'm just kind of wiggling it around in the light a little bit so you can see what that looks like. And the the, the back of the axe head is pretty easy here. There's a lot of dips that are downward, so I'm not really doing a ton in terms of trying to build up that black. It's just basically a black line under the... Um, under the bevel of that axe and then just a very small bit of the heavy metal on the very tip just to give some of that shine. So now I'm coming back in with this heavy metal and I'm doing kind of like that GW special of edge highlighting. And edge highlighting isn't something that I would typically do, uh, but with metals it works really well because those edges are going to catch and reflect a lot of light. And since they are so reflective, the uh, the edge highlight works really well here in areas where you don't have that highlight. Now this is probably a bit more of a screwball-y part for the video because uh, I thought that I was going to be able to capture doing the purple glow in his chest really well, but Barnabas's mouth gets in the way quite a bit. So I'll kind of explain it here as we go and 
Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure people are always interested in learning about how to paint glows in privateer press models because it's such a prevalent effect in the game. But uh, definitely leave a comment below if you'd like to see a video solely explaining how to paint glows of varying colors. That way I can kind of focus those videos. But the first thing I'm doing here is grabbing uh, Gene Stealer Purple from Games Workshop mixed with uh, a little bit of Hexed Lichen from Vallejo Game Color. And this is thinned down quite a bit. I think it's probably two to one. And the, the, the gist here is I'm just trying to build up the darkest color first for the glow so that I can kind of tint the rest of the model so I don't have to fight the colors that are underneath it that much. And then I'm doing some glow on the carvings in the axe here. This is just me taking the paint and pushing it from the outside of the carving to the inside of the carving. And that gives me kind of this, like, I guess you'd call it an OSL effect. Uh, it's not completely perfect because the, the area I'm working on here isn't super big and I don't want to really take the time to kind of blend it out and make sure that the transition's really smooth. So it's going to be a little blocky, but not a ton here. Next, I'm coming back in with that Hex Lichen and Games Workshop uh, Gene Stealer Purple Mix, and I'm just trying to darken the tone a little bit more. Uh, in hindsight, I really did want the purple glow for this model, but since I pointed the viscera in his chest to be more purpley, uh, this glow is a little bit hard to work with. I'm kind of fighting against the colors that are underneath in order to get this really cool glowy effect. So I probably could have done something more towards the greenish yellow side, but then I'd be clashing with the, or not clashing so much, but then I would be, it wouldn't look right against that green skin. So I think I kind of painted myself in a corner here and trying to get a little too techy with the, uh, the color choices that I've selected. So maybe just painting the, the viscera in his chest to be more like the way his mouth is might have given me a little bit better of a brightness on this one. So there's definitely some trappings when you try to get really like uh, deep into the color theory tank because you can definitely end up like uh, putting yourself in a bad position later. Now I'm going in with the uh, straight gene stealer purple just to kind of build up a little bit more of that glow you saw that i was able to drop some of that into the lines on the axe where it's carved in and then i'm just kind of jamming that color in behind the heart now there's it's kind of difficult to do this the way i want to because the heart is so uh it protrudes so much so there's definitely some points where i'm kind of clipping the heart when i don't want to with this paint but really the the light's going to be kind of shining from the back end of that heart and not from the heart itself i still want that heart to be really recognizable because i think it's a key feature on the model so we're just kind of taking a watered down gene stealer purple and then uh slamming that in there and then dragging it out with the brush i think now we've kind of gotten to the mix of the, the secret of painting glows. I think oftentimes people get a little too zealous with glows and they decide to take their, their super bright or neon color and then mix white into it. But when I had discussed earlier, white really kills the vibrance of something. So in order to combat that, you've got to mix your current color with one color up on the traditional color wheel plus white in order to maintain that vibrance. So that's what I've done here is I've taken a little bit of, it's Games Workshop Ice Blue or Magic Blue or something, but it's just a really sky blue color. This The reason why I'm not giving you the right name, mostly because I can't remember it, but also because the game's been, or that color's been out of production for a while and the current Games Workshop equivalents just don't quite match it. I think uh, Vallejo Game Color has probably a good match for it. I think it's it might even just be Magic or Ice Blue, one or the other. But um any super bright blue will do. You kind of get what I'm what I'm dropping when I when I talk about light blue there. So that color I made it a little bit more strong towards the back of the heart, and that kind of gives me this glow effect. But now I've taken more white and I've mixed that in, and you can see I'm trying to jam a little bit more of a solid color into the heart, and I've have messed up not only by pulling the model off camera, but also uh, I got some extra on the heart where I didn't want it. And this is kind of the result after cleaning that up. Um, we're, we're going to, I think now I'm going in with maybe just a straight white. And uh, this is just to add some really 
uh, pointed glows along the line of the X. I'm not doing it so much in the heart because I feel like I've kind of pushed it as far as I can go with that one. And, oh, I guess maybe I do. I'm sorry. This is a, this model took a very long time to work on. So like, there's a lot of things that I've forgotten about it. And I do now realize the trappings of trying to paint an entire high tech model and try to put it on here to describe it to people. So any of these, again, any of these techniques that you feel like you're just not getting, put them in the comments below, and I'll be able to try and make videos specifically on those so they're not so haphazard. But these are the end results of painting Barnabas II, or Barnabas the Lord of Blood, or not the Lord of Blood, he's just Blood of Lord, or Lord of Blood, sorry, I was just mixing that up. But I've finished the the swamp base. It looks pretty sweet. The bones on the on his little surfboard are a little bit more akin to how I would paint bone. But you can see the glow comes across okay, just not perfectly. But uh, again, any questions, leave them below. And uh, I'll try and keep up with these painting videos as much as I can. Thanks for watching, and especially thanks if you made it through the whole video here. This was a long, long video, and definitely not what I had anticipated when I first decided to pick up this project.